All right, so Banach spaces, Hilbert spaces. We've already done the setup on what kind of space we want. So we also need notions of matrix norms, like I said. So we work with what is called induced matrix norm. Okay, it's induced by the uh, corresponding vector norm, and hence it's called the induced matrix norm. All right. So what is the matrix norm for a matrix A? By the way, this matrix does not need to be uh, square or invertible or anything like that. You can compute the norm for any matrix. Yeah. So the p norm for a matrix is basically defined using the supremum. Yeah. Supremum over x not equal to zero. The p norm of a times x divided by the p norm of x. Say, I'm sorry. This is a matrix norm. Yeah. This is how you. This is the notation for the matrix norm. Yeah. And this is the definition for the matrix norm. That is exactly how you define it. It is the supremum over all x not zero, a x p norm of a x, and divided by norm of x p norm of x. Okay. So obviously you have to imagine that the x has to be compatible with a. I can't really take arbitrary you know uh, x and arbitrary vector spaces, right? I mean. Yeah, if it's a, a one cross two matrix, I can't take a three dimensional vector. Yeah, this is so. So x has to be something that you can actually make this multiplication happen. Okay, but remember that the vec the size of the vector in the numerator and the size of the vector in the denominator don't have to be the same. Yeah, you understand that you can compute the p norm for any vector space, right? So it doesn't matter what is the size of the vector itself. Okay. So you compute the p norm of the numerator and p norm of the denominator. Since x is not zero, therefore this is you know this is a valid uh, operation, yeah. And you look at the ratio. This ratio, um, and when you look at the supremum, it's somehow the maximum. It's a generalization of the maximum. Okay. So when you look at the ratio and you take a supremum, you are essentially measuring the maximum magnification that a Matrix gives to a vector. Okay, somehow measuring the maximum magnification in some sense. That is how how much the vector gets you know enlarged in some sense, lengthened in some sense. Yeah, by a particular matrix. That's really what you intuitively get out of a matrix norm. Okay, makes sense because vector norms also measure the size of the vector or length of the vector. Similarly, here the matrix induced norm measures somehow the Uh, size of the matrix, but in how it influences a particular vector space. Okay, if you change the vector space, you might get a different answer. All right, so therefore it is induced. Yeah, remember. Okay, so what is the supremum? The supremum is defined as the least upper bound. Okay, this is the best definition of supremum you can have. It is called the least upper bound. Yeah, so uh, of course you can imagine there is an upper bound always. Yeah. But then you are looking for the least upper bound. This is what is the supremum, and the more formal definition is that the supremum for a set S in R closure, which is basically R union infinity, yeah, is the smallest value of y such that for all x in S, x is less than equal to y. Okay, exactly the least upper bound written in mathematical terms. Okay. It is not just an upper bound. Okay, if I take this set, if I take this zero one open interval as my set S, then you know that one, two, three, four, five, all of them are upper bounds. Everything is an upper bound, but the supremum is the least upper bound. Okay, yeah, just to you know sort of do a thought experiment. If I say the supremum is actually one minus epsilon or some positive epsilon, okay, but then I know that um 1 minus epsilon plus delta can also belong to 0 1 correct i just have to choose my delta appropriately as long as delta is less than epsilon 1 minus epsilon plus delta also belongs to the 0 1 open interval but then 1 minus epsilon plus delta is greater than 1 minus epsilon so 1 minus epsilon cannot be a supremum okay 
the simple idea. So 1 minus epsilon is not a supremum for any positive epsilon. Okay. So the only possibility is that epsilon is exactly 0 and 1 is the supremum. Okay. Okay. Least upper bound. Yeah. Again, for most of you, this may be very intuitive in this example that 1 is the supremum and why did I make this proof, uh, you know, whatever, funny looking proof. But in some more complicated cases, you have to use these kinds of proofs. Okay. Anyway, so in this case, it's very obvious that the for an open interval 0, 1, 1 has to be the supremum because everything below 1 is part of the set. That's the idea of an open set. Okay. 1 is not included in this set. Very nice. Very good point. Okay. So, if I thought of 0, 1 open interval as my vector space, then the supremum is not in the set. Okay. This is the difference between a supremum and a maximum. A maximum will always be part of the set. Okay. So, therefore, there are many scenarios of sets for which you cannot define a maximum. And hence, you have to talk about a supremum. That is the whole reason for talking about a supremum. Okay. That the maximum may not exist in the set. Right. Okay. Yes. I'll say that again. Absolutely. That's also possible. So, that's what I'm saying. So, there is couple of reasons why you talk about the supremum. One is that the maximum may not be part of the set. Yeah. So, see, whenever I, whenever I talk about a vector space, all right, once I define a vector space, you have to almost think that my world ends there. Yeah. Although you know that 2 is there, 3 is there, minus 1 is there, but for all intents and purposes, between 0, 1 is my world. That is the end. Because all my analysis, everything I do is inside that set. So, anything that does not lie in that set, is a problem for me in some sense or yeah, I do not understand it. Okay. So, supremum is a way of sort of uh, giving this extension. Okay. It talks about, uh, but again, uh, all of this works if there is a superset in some sense. Okay? There is something beyond 0, 1, so everything works. Yeah. So, of course, like you are saying, there are sets where there is no maximum. If I think about set 0 infinity, yeah, if I think of a set 0 infinity, then you will say that the supremum is infinity. Okay. So, infinity is allowed. So, therefore, when we talk about supremum, infinity is allowed. Yeah. When we talk real numbers, infinity is not allowed. Yeah. So, if you give me a set 0 infinity, I will still say there is a supremum, but it is infinity. Okay. Which is useless sort of. So, I mean, mostly you cannot do anything with it. But anyway, we still say that supremum is infinity. All right. Let us look at another example. Uh, in this case, it is a function. Okay, it's a it's a set created from a image of a function. Okay, so if I look at the function f of x, which is one minus e minus x, and x is actually non-negative real numbers. Yeah, and I look at the set E, which is actually the image of f. I hope you understand what is the image of f. It's just all the values that f takes. Yeah, so the image of f is actually exactly this, right? What is the image of f? It's this guy because it is a nice continuous function in fact smooth function yeah so the image of f is exactly this so what is the supremum one yeah but it is not contained in e okay so basically when the supremum is contained in the set you can just replace the soup notation with the max notation okay also, when the supremum is contained in a set, folks who have done real analysis and hopefully SC639 will know that the set is, if the set contains its supremum and infimum, then the set is what? Set is a closed set. Okay. If the set contains its supremum and infimum or if the other way around, if the supremum and infimum of a set are in the set, then it is a closed set. Okay, so uh, we talk about a few matrix properties also. We use a lot of these symmetric matrices, symmetric square matrices, uh, to design these Lyapunov functions and so on and so forth. So we like to know some properties of these. 
first all eigen values of symmetric matrices are real yeah uh, most of you should know all of this a is said to be a is positive definite if and only if any one of these is satisfied yeah that alpha transpose a alpha is strictly positive for non zero alpha all eigen values of a are strictly positive there exists a non singular decomposition q looks like that and every principal minor of a is positive okay so a symmetric matrix is positive definite if this happens yeah we never talk about definiteness of non symmetric matrices okay one can extend that definition but remember the eigen values of non symmetric matrices are possibly complex okay so it doesn't give you nice results okay so we, whenever we say positive definite matrices we are invariably talking about symmetric matrices okay all right the other thing for symmetric matrices is this inequality which we use extensively extensively i mean this inequality has some name also but i forget it now yeah but basically it says that if you take a quadratic product or a quadratic form using this matrix so this is a what is a quadratic form yeah then it is lower bounded by lambda min alpha transpose alpha and upper bounded by lambda max alpha transpose alpha okay so very very important inequality very simple but very important inequality we keep using this regularly in our lyapunov analysis okay so please remember this the other important thing to remember is that this expression is virtually impossible to compute by hand yeah if i ask you to compute a supremum of ax over x and all that you will actually have to write some code and do some kind of a search or do some optimization to actually find this answer yeah so um, very painful so there are actually simpler formula here well known formula for particular matrix norms matrix induced norms so the infinity norm is max absolute row sum the one norm is max absolute column sum and the two norm is largest singular value so square root of lambda max a transpose a. okay so these more or less this, these three are the ones that get used more often than not so we are not uh, concerned and then you have this anyway the cauchy schwarz inequality i have said find the general proof but actually the general proof is here there is a proof here so we will look at that later very quickly uh, but the cauchy schwarz inequality is a general inequality for all norms and obviously it is valid also for matrix induced norms matrix induced norm is also a valid norm by the way as soon as i Uh, made a norm definition for matrices i hope you understand that matrices are also vector spaces so i mean they form the linear norm linear space yeah so this is evident because uh, superposition works i mean if you take any two same dimensional matrices and then you take a linear combination it's the same dimension matrix and all that yeah so matrices also form a vector space i mean not different dimensional matrices and all but yeah as long as your matrix dimension is fixed you are fine okay yeah so uh, of course there are simple examples and i'm i don't know if i should go to these but yeah i mean uh, you have the row sum the column sum and so on so one norm infinity norm and uh, two norm are rather easy to compute yeah basically you just have to apply these formula yeah very straight forward all i've done is compute the absolute row sum absolute column sum taken the maximum absolute row sum that's the infinity norm taken the ab absolute maximum column sum that is the one norm and then the two norm is you have to compute a transpose a and uh, compute the largest eigen value yeah little bit more work all right great great any questions yes all right so um, the nice thing is i mean i hope you uh, you could have guessed by this formula itself yeah that um, though we use the supremum there it it sort of turns out to have some kind of a maximum expression eventually 
yeah so these uh, for uh, when you are talking about um, real value matrices so these nice things happen the definitions are uh, meant for general vector spaces and supremum is by definition i mean i can't i mean i can't say why not i mean and cannot be the maximum yeah for general vector spaces okay so but for again real valued symmetric matrices well actually this i am I, I apologize no no nah, nah, i think I, these are separate yeah yeah he for these you don't need any symmetry or anything yeah i mean i, I think that's pretty clear i think only this much is for symmetric and this is for the induced norm all right so for the real valued ones yes you have any weight becomes a maximum in general no right i cannot make that definition yeah it is the supreme it will be what it will be yeah if it's not in the set it's not in the set all right supremum always exists can be infinity infinity is an option so so that's not a issue as such all right great now that we have done vector norms and matrix norms yeah uh, we have to go to signal norms yeah i promise you is the final final norm yeah no more yeah so uh, see we are progressing pretty uh, linearly yeah uh, we have states we have systems we have states yeah our aim is to talk about size of states distance of states from other states and things like that yeah and now um, states are vectors so therefore we looked at vector norms but then if you think of linear system or if you think of lyapunov function there are matrices involved so therefore we also need to talk about matrix norms uh, finally uh, when we solve these states and create trajectories they are functions of time therefore they are signals right so we have to talk about signal norms yeah so the vector norms give you some kind of a point wise behavior so once i freeze time for example for example i say that i want to look at the look at the behavior at 5 seconds then my states are a vector and then i can look at all these vector norms yeah but once uh, if i want to look at the behavior of a uh, you know of a signal over a period of time then i need signal norms okay and that's what these signal norms do you will see so if i am given a vector signal yeah it it's almost looking like it's a function of time you get some non negative uh, real inputs and you get uh, scalar sorry vector valued outputs yeah uh, then the signal norm is the p signal norm or xp is basically the integral over 0 to infinity why 0 to infinity because it's time going from 0 to infinity and you take any arbitrary vector norm here x is any arbitrary vector norm not necessarily the p norm okay this is an arbitrary vector norm not necessarily the p norm though you are computing the p norm here okay don't get confused so the p signal norm is integral 0 to infinity vector norm to the power p dt and take the pth root of this integral similarly the infinity norm again has the supremum right is supremum over all time of this vector norm okay supremum over all time of this vector norm like i said the vector norm is arbitrary does not have to be the for example if you are computing the two signal norm the vector norm you use does not have to be the two norm it can be the one norm yeah the only thing you have to remember is for a single problem that you are working out stick to the same vector norm yeah don't switch between 1 2 3 and just like you know yeah then you are not going to get any consistent results all your results will be wrong yeah but you are free to choose any vector norm yeah not restricted by this p or by this infinity okay doesn't have to be the infinity norm here yeah in fact that would be wrong so if you have infinity norm here you use infinity norm here and then if you have p norm here you use the p norm here so basically you ended up using different vector norms in the same problem that's not okay you have to use the same vector norm for the entire problem yeah you can stick to any vector norm. yeah is that clear yeah yes okay all right so like i said in all the above definitions x signifies any vector norm the choice does not matter however never switch the norm in between be consistent okay 
whenever a p signal norm is finite we say that the signal belongs to lp space yeah so signal norms actually define a uh, rather big space of functions okay rather big class of functions yeah so these are called this is called the lp space and this has significance not just in control and so on yeah uh, this has significance in a much larger uh, variety uh, you know array of math yeah for example whenever you talk about any kind of um, uh, function approximation using series you need lp assumptions yeah fourier series for example when does the fourier series converge it only converges when you are in some particular lp space okay so convergence of series and and when when do taylor series converge when do fourier series converge so these uh, sort of um, you know uh, um, tools require you to have some kind of an lp space assumption so what i'm saying is this lp space has much much wider application than just in controls so we are just using it for some very small purpose is what i would say okay so uh, the other thing to remember is that l infinity that is when the infinity norm is bounded it's exactly the same as being as saying that x is itself a bounded signal okay uh, proof is pretty straight forward yeah um uh, i'm not sure if i if you need to i mean anyway i can look at one side of it so the infinity norm is this guy yeah if a function is bounded it means that there exists some positive number such that the norm is smaller than that positive number so if the norm is smaller than m the vector norm is smaller than m notice this is the vector norm notation yeah now whenever i put the time argument then i am computing a vector norm because i froze time whenever there is no time argument notice because of because i integrated or i took supremum the time argument is vanished right therefore on the left hand side you never see any time argument okay whenever i am computing a signal norm there is no time argument okay so is important notation wise remember yeah so no time argument here but in all the vector norms here you see the time argument appear yeah because without freezing time i don't have a vector i have a signal right so once i put some particular time in here i have a vector then i can compute a vector norm okay so this will be our notation whenever i compute a vector norm the time argument will be evident will appear and if i am computing a signal norm there will be no time argument all right great so when i say here that a function a signal is uh, bounded it means that in the norm it is less than equal to some upper bound yeah which means that supremum itself is also upper bound and because if, for all time this is less than equal to m therefore the supremum itself is upper bound yeah so very straight forward yeah which means that x belongs to l infinity similarly if x, if if the infinity norm is some constant it means that the supremum is some constant which means that every for all time this has to be less than equal to m therefore function is uh, the signal is bounded okay so both ways you can prove so essentially uh, l infinity is identical to having a bounded signal okay so l infinity signals are bounded signals everything in l infinity space is a bounded signal yeah the uh, interesting thing to remember is that if you take any two vector norms there is a property of norm equivalence what is the norm equivalence it means that um, your p norm and q norm can are always relatable by constants alpha and beta okay for any value of xt doesn't matter what how big xt becomes or how small xt becomes the two norms the two norms p and q norms vector norms are relatable by a constant yeah so alpha norm xt p is less than equal to xt q less than equal to beta norm xt p okay and vice versa yeah if you, if you have p in the middle you can still find some other constants right it will be 1 over alpha and 1 over beta okay so the idea is vector norms can always be related to each other yeah so they have what is called norm equivalence on the other hand uh, 
signal norms do not have norm equivalence. You, if you have a signal which is in L1 space, it may not be in L2 space. If it is in L infinity space, it may not be in L2 space. So, if, if just because one norm is uh, behaving nicely, does not mean the other will. Yeah. So, a very simple example is this guy. If I take my signal as this guy, yeah, and I use my and I use the two vector norm. I have decided to use the two vector norm, yeah, because I know that it is easy. The two vector norm of this guy is just one, right. Do you believe that? The two vector norm of xt is just one because it is cos squared t plus sin squared t square root, which is one, okay. So, if I take the infinity norm, it is just the supremum of this guy. So, it is supremum of cos squared t plus sin squared t and is just 1, right. On the other hand, if I take the 1 norm, then this is integral 0 to infinity of 1, which is infinity. I just took the 2 norm again here, 2 norm here too, no problem, yeah. So, the infinity norm is just 1, which essentially indicates that it is a bounded signal and it is, right, obviously bounded signal, but the one norm is actually infinity. Huh? It is a no, 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 boundedness is only connected to the infinity norm, one norm, two norm do not have any connotations with boundedness, they are not connected to boundedness at all, they are you can think of them as different function spaces with different properties, yeah. The infinity norm is bounded which means that the function is also bounded. However, the function is not in L1 space at all, yeah. And this is a big conundrum, right. I mean, you see that it has nice infinity norm, nice L1, yeah. But it is, uh, sorry, nice L infinity norm, but it is not in L1 space, yeah. Similarly, L2 and so on, you can compute L2 norm, any LP norm for example, for that matter. Yeah, this function is definitely in L infinity, but it is not in any LP. Yeah, because it will always have one integrated from 0 to infinity and that will essentially give you infinity, okay. So, norm equivalence does not work for signal norms, alright.